Hi, everybody. This is Joanne with Read Science and my co-host, Jeff Schomeyer. We are here tonight with Zach and Kelly Wienersmith. I said it, Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> if we said it wrong, stop me now, right? Oh, that's right. You said it right. I said it. Yay. Anyway, we are here talking with them because they wrote a great book, an informative and funny book, and uh, literally, um, I laughed. I did a, a spit take on the airplane with my Coke. <laughs> when, when actually I was listening to the book um, because I didn't want to carry the book on the plane. So the book is finished. <laughs> and so I'm listening and Kelly narrates, and great job by the way. Thank you. And she said, I was very disappointed to learn that FMRS is not pronounced for Mrs. <laughs> 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 because it was very funny. Anyway, so the book is Soonish, 10 Emerging Technologies that will Improve and or Ruin Everything. So unlike futuristic books that just uh, tell us what really they think is going to happen and nothing could possibly go wrong with this, they mm. they... They lay it out, 10 things. So um, th thank you for coming on the show. We're glad you're here. Thanks, thanks. for having us. Yeah, thanks. We're thrilled to be here. So um, let's see. Um, Kelly, I'm going to introduce you. Um, I'm a biologist. You're a biologist. Yay. This is great. Um, made me wonder if you had to take sabbatical to get this book done and do all the promotion. <laughs> Kind of. <laughs> Pretty busy. So uh, you study host behavior, uh, how host behavior influences the risk of infection with parasites and how parasites change host behavior. Well, that's a hot topic. So we know Ed Yong has written about that a bunch for us and Carl Zimmer too. So um, to me. anyway, yeah. So, uh, and you do a podcast with your husband who is sitting there. And Jeff, I will let you introduce Zach. <laughs> go on, go on to Zach Wiener Smith. If I understand correctly, he's the Wiener part of the Wiener Smith. Yes, originally. Right? <laughs> yeah. the maiden name was Wiener. <laughs> to me, and to many, many, many adoring fans, he is best known as the person who created and still draws and writes Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal, a web comic providing trenchant and funny comic nutrition since five September two thousand two. If I got that right, and so. <laughs> Wow. By, the, by this morning, I, I estimated that you've posted more than a gazillion or so cartoons. Approximately, yeah. yeah. <laughs> about that way. It's like, the comic can also be read in French, I was happy to discover, as Le, le, yes, le, le Serial du Dimanche Matin. Wikipedia tells me he has a degree in literature from Pitzer College, but that he's also studied physics at San Jose State University, and I thought I could recognize some physicist sensibility in his work because I'm one of those. Uh, yeah, by, his, a little bit. by his own admission, somewhere in this book, Soonish, he says he was very fond of his in his youth of making wiener jokes, which doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Although I should hasten to add that the Wiener Smith's Soonish is no joke. So well, welcome, Zach and Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. I have, I have sort of a, a two-part way to begin. And it's kind of odd. It's about process in the book. We'll get around to all of the cool stuff I expect because it comes up. But Joanne and I are also interested in process. And I think a lot of our, our readers might be, our listeners might be interested in process. And the odd thing is, is that parts, part one comes from the first page of the book. And part two comes like from the second to the last page of whole thing. At the very beginning, the very first sentence in the book, you said, this is one of those books where we predict the future. And this is good to know. And as you point out, it's easy getting the predictions. It's easy making the predictions, but getting them right is, is a lot harder. And so part of the question is, so why do it? And I wondered whether it was fair to say that you're asking us not to focus on the accuracy of the predictions, but on the interesting potential ideas and the questions that might get us there. And then when I got to the very end of it tonight, someplace down here, I was reading. Well, I'll find it. Oh, I know, I know. Someplace. Anyway, you talked about how um, everything was fine and you had co collected some material and then you gave the pitch to Penguin 
and they accepted it. And then you had to get real about the book and you, you gave us some ideas of things that got left out for rather good reasons. And so I'm interested in hearing about the process before and after Penguin accepted the pitch, what it means to make the pitch, what you tell them in the pitch, and then how much you, <laughs> you were terrified after you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, the pitch, I believe the final pitch we were presented was for a book with 25 technologies. Uh, and uh, which so, so um, it says on the cover, so it's not a spoiler, I guess. It's, we got it down to 10. And essentially what happened is, I think in our original pitch, we, we did two chapters which were about 3,000 words and then one which was like 6,000. <laughs> and, and what ended up happening is we just kept expanding them and the editor kept liking them more. And so we just kept asking like, hey, can we do fewer chapters with more detail? And then mm -hmm. iterated over and over again, eventually resulted in, I, I think our final manuscript had actually 11 chapters. We ended up cutting one more, uh, which actually isn't mentioned in the book, but um, mostly for space constraints. Um, but but yeah, it was kind of this, this like, we'd get into a topic and be like, I just cannot explain this well and properly mm -hmm. in you know fewer than, in the case of, for example, brain computer interfaces, fewer than say 10,000 words, because um, yeah. it's, it's just a lot of stuff and it's all interesting stuff. You know, or or the the other one like that is the 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 cheap access to space chapter, which I, I think the, the original um, version of that chapter was like sixteen thousand words, and we really like that was really <laughs> painful because like everything in that topic is fascinating. So like we just had to cut out great stuff to get it down to the most sort of crucial stuff. Um, so, but we yeah, eventually we settled on long chapters and more detail. So, but we also you have just an interpolation. If you have advice that's really good for people who are thinking about writing is that you learn an awful lot about what your book is about while you're doing it, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. yeah, we also ended up really backing off of predictions. And so we, we talk about, you know, technologies that might work out and what needs to happen if they're going to work out and then different futures that could maybe happen. But at the end, we don't say, and we think this is the most likely and the technology is probably 10 years out because it, it just turns out that most of those predictions that other people make are wrong, and it's a really great way to make sure that people look back at your book and have a good laugh. Uh, and so <laughs> we felt like, that. but we also felt like what's much more interesting is the challenges in that are facing these technologies, not that we think a space elevator might be 50 years off, who cares how long we think it's gonna be off, we're probably gonna be wrong. What's more interesting is we don't know how to make the cable for a space elevator, but people are working on it. Like that's the cool stuff. So we we backed off of predictions quite a bit. Yeah. Well, right. that's, that's, that's that interesting. Must have worked well for you too, because I didn't really even notice that. <laughs> good, good. good. <laughs> well, I I remember. So I I was teaching a bioengineering class, and the students, or I'd be showing these videos, and every single interview, the the scientists would say, "Yeah, uh, lab grown hearts are about ten years away." Or, <laughs> You know, everything was 10 years away, and I went, that cannot be true. You know, I, I think maybe years. this is the science communication office at the university says, just say 10 years. Uh, <laughs> so, too long guess, discourages so, them, and too short, it's like, yeah. no way. <laughs> That's I think been one of the great, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Kelly. So I think that gets fields in trouble because I think that people are then disappointed when the technology doesn't show up 10 years later. And so I think that there's a lot of people who are disappointed in fusion. Mm -hmm. Now, another are people who say, you know, fusion is the energy of the future and it always will be because it's always 10 or something years away, 50, 50 years, years, years yeah. away or something yeah. like that. And so it's, all, it's been 10 years away for the last four decades at least. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like I, I understand why you want to make people excited, but I think promising a deadline that's much sooner than than reality mm -hmm. or a deadline that you really have no certainty in just makes people sort of upset about science and technology because mm -hmm. it's not delivering as fast as it and says it, it, it will. obscures the actual progress that's happening, uh, even mm -hmm. in fields like fusion, which feel very painfully slow. Mm -hmm. Well, so here's a quotation that you were talking about history and things, and there were two actually that struck out at me. And you said, the contingent nature of technological developments is why we don't have a lunar base, even though we thought we would by now, but we do have pocket sized supercomputers which few people saw coming. And you could talk, could talk about all those technologies related to that, but who's gonna guess what actually, actually happens? Um, uh, yeah, do you wanna tell the story? Sure, sure, uh, uh, I'll try to go quickly. But yeah, so we tell this story um, that goes like this, which is, 
um, there's this device called a superconducting quantum interference device, um, mm -hmm. which we talk about in the book mainly in the context of a quote unquote brain reading device, a device that detects faint neural yeah. signals. Um, and, but the, the story of how we get it, it, I mean, we are just telling a story, but but uh, the way you could say it is it starts with Michael Faraday in, in the 19th century blowing glass, because you used mm -hmm. to have to blow glass for your own equipment. We actually, we were just at the um, Royal Institute, and apparently he was lousy at it. We didn't know that until we, we didn't put that in the book. Apparently really bad at, at glass making. But anyway, so the story is he's making glassware, and he accidentally traps um, some gas in, an, I believe, carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. um, and it liquefies which is kind of startling because carbon dioxide feels fundamentally gassy. Yeah. Um, and uh, and this leads to this um, craze for liquefying stubbornly gassy gases. And the best way to do that is refrigeration, which becomes this 19th century pursuit uh, and that kind of culminates in the early 20th century. And then around then people will start wondering, hey, can we, you know, like we have these things called conductors. They seem to conduct better when they get colder. <laughs> what if we, we now have these ultra cold gases? We have liquid hydrogen. What happens when we ultra cool metals? It turns out some metals have this weird thing where before they hit zero, uh, they superconduct. They have this weird thing. And then superconducting still isn't fully explained, and it doesn't become partially explained until like mm -hmm. the 50s. And then there's this guy named Brian Josephson who's kind of off his rocker, uh, but, <laughs> come, but has a Nobel Prize because he came up with this thing called the Josephson Junction, which apparently violated the standard theory. I understand Bardeen, actually, uh, the guy who, the, the B in BCS theory, yeah. Uh, told them that it was it must be wrong uh, and that had to recant that uh, and and anyway so this this device um, called the Joseph's injunction long story short allows you to detect very fine uh, magnetic uh, fields and that allows you to make this device um, called the superconducting quantum interference device that can detect faint neural signals so the, the funny thing is it's this like string of unrelated developments uh, and, and the, the important thing to note is you couldn't have gone to Michael Faraday and said hey do you think this tube of, of liquid will one day become like a brain reading device? I would have thought you were you were you were insane. Uh, and um, and it, it's it's kind of the same thing with uh, with with what we're doing now. Like who knows what we're working on now will turn out in two hundred years to be mm -hmm. something extraordinary. Um, so why were, bother predicting? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I thought it was very perceptive when you wrote. There is nothing about history that necessarily had to be as it was. Yeah. It, it's true, you know. The the I was just reading a fun book about this. I'm sure you know this. The the the, the first device that was kind of like a steam engine, the Aeolo pile, was from mm -hmm. like year 100 uh, uh, CE. You know, so we could have had a dynamo 2,000 years ago. It's just nobody thought to put a magnet on it. Um, was it the right time for it, or something? The zeitgeist wasn't. wasn't yeah, or, or or what? I mean, it could have been dumb luck. Who knows? I mean, uh, or yeah, but uh, but yeah, technology is very contingent. So. Um, it's, it's probably not worth guessing, or at least uh, all the things you could guess are obvious, you know, like you, mm -hmm. I, I can guess also, like you can guess, I like my, my, my kid is, is three. I could give her a thing that's like shows more law, Moore's law and say, could you extend this out 20 years? She'd probably get it about right. You know, and I, I guess you could call that a prediction. Um, uh, I, I, was, sponge, yes. <laughs> um, I would say you were looking at the, the layout of the book. Um, and and listening when I was listening to you uh, read it, I, you know, you have a very nice like formula for the book. Mm -hmm. This is the thing. This is what it is. This is what it could do for us. This is why we don't have it. This is what mm -hmm. could go wrong when we get it. You know, maybe not exactly in that order, but every single thing sort of follows this order. And I felt that super comfort comforting, right? Like. And that's where I felt like it differed from other futuristic books, you know, that talk about things and say, yeah, and this is what it is. And they might talk a little bit about the constraints, but I just felt like this was done in, a, in such a step-by-step -step way um, yeah. that it was very accessible. Mm -hmm. And I think it's accessible to a very large audience. And, and also non-frustrating uh, non to people who actually maybe know the field. Yeah, right. Hopefully. Yeah, so that structure was also very comforting from the standpoint of needing to write it because we sort of knew like what we were looking for as we were doing the reading for each section. So as we'd go through the primary literature, we could kind of take notes and put it, you know, underneath the section we thought it was going to go in. Right. Uh, but it's very good to hear that you think that it's it's good for a broad audience because we really wanted like we we felt feel like we've only achieved our goal if this book could be picked up by an intrigued smart, you know, an interesting patient, patient, smart person <laughs> who knows nothing about these technologies, 
who at the end could feel like they could like vaguely sort of generally explain it to someone else at a bar if someone asked, hey, what's the deal with fusion? Uh, which we're told suggests we don't know what bars are like. But uh, <laughs> yeah. in case you were in one of those bars, uh, none, none, of the, none of the physics related stuff uh, concerned me, and Joanne knows I can be harsh <laughs> with authors who get things you know, gratuitously wrong. But no, I, I thought it, it did a very nice uh, we, job. The, 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 the chapters that had physics we thought we couldn't explain properly are the ones that got killed, or some of them are. Uh, I think I understand your purpose, your, your point when you were talking about um, superconductors, but also about quantum. Whatever it was. Oh, various quantum effects and things, the quantum computing, that was it. And it's like, you know, there's just too much mm -hmm. and there's too much that could go wrong and you still end up mystifying people probably because- Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I think you made a good choice there. Yeah, so so actually as a biologist, a cell biologist, you know, I love the, and, and having taught a course, so the bioengineering course I was teaching was cell culture and tissue engineering, the concepts of how do we get cells to form into something Mm -hmm. that could be used as tissue. And I felt well, you, you treated that very well. You're a biologist, so the <laughs> concepts are there. So, um, you know, I thought, well, this is great. And I actually, I, I sort of pride myself on sort of knowing something about lots of different things. <laughs> I didn't know about bucket of stuff. <laughs> I, I uh -huh. knew nothing about bucket of stuff. And I was yeah. surprised as heck to learn about this and, that, and that intrigued field. and scared. I was a little scared. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that field has been the one we've gotten asked about a lot. I think we only kind of knew about it because we were, I, I think because we were friends with um, Eric and Marty Domain who do some like origami stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of like was the thread that pulled us into this whole weird universe. And then it turned out we actually knew other people like Justin Morfell, um is one we already knew, but I hadn't thought of his work in this category, but I knew he did like swarm robotics. Um, and so we just ended up, it, it, it was a tough chapter because, well, it was both, both hard and easy because it was hard to find the literature, but it was easy because there wasn't that much. So it was, it was easy to sort of feel we'd done a pretty comprehensive job uh, um, doing the research. But yeah, finding the keywords was actually quite difficult for that chapter. Um, that was a very hard one to get the, the fundamental books uh, and papers. Mm -hmm. and the background on the bunch of stuff? Oh, yes, of course. So, yeah. so Essentially, the idea is that you know, there's this field called programmable matter, and what they're trying to do is make it so that any of your stuff, like the cup that sits on your desk, can become something else. So your computer can do nearly infinite things, but this cup does one thing. And so if you could get this cup so that you could program it, so it could go from being a cup to being your laptop to being a table or something, that would be great. Uh, and so the ultimate goal of this field is to be able to make what they call the bucket of stuff, and the idea here is that you could have many, many super tiny robots in a bucket, and you could say, robots, make me a wrench. And then a wrench would rise up out of the bucket, and it would be as firm as you needed it to be so that you could use the wrench. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you could put the wrench back in. It would sort of dissolve back into the bucket. And then you could say, bucket, make me a plunger. And then it would you know, give you a plunger <laughs> with like a hard handle and a flexible cup. It would be able to accomplish both of those material challenges, uh, and it would work great. And so... That is very far away, but there's <laughs> there's some reason to be optimistic. So people have been able to figure out ways to make tiny robots talk to each other and do interesting things. Uh, so for example, maybe you can talk about the Roombots, but I'll talk about yes. the Kilobots. So there's a group at Harvard mm -hmm. that uh, has a project called the Kilobots, and it's 1,024 mm -hmm. little robots that look like a watch battery with three legs. And mm -hmm. they told the robots to go from, I think, a two-dimensional star to a wrench and they had a little like algorithm that they followed to make that happen and it took them about six hours to form the wrench <laughs> so like not a very useful time frame and also not a very to go to lows faster right yeah, yeah. and it, and the wrench was not usable when it was all said and done it was, it was just like an outline of a wrench, yeah. of a wrench. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of challenges to be yeah. overcome so you got to figure out how each of these robots are going to be powered if they're super tiny mm -hmm. are you going to like zap power into the bucket or is each one going to have a little battery if they've got a little battery now they need to be a little bit bigger uh there's material challenges if you want the stuff in that bucket to be able to be a nice strong wrench and then also the cup on your plunger mm -hmm. uh so that's difficult but probably the hardest thing is that you would need to have an algorithm that could make millions of little robots be able to become anything you tell it and like, if you imagine a marching band, even getting a hundred people to do a fairly simple two-dimensional object 
requires a lot of practice and a lot of training. And as right. you add more individuals and as it becomes 3D, it becomes more than just additively difficult. It mm -hmm. starts to become much, much, much more difficult with each robot that gets added. And so writing the algorithm for truly universal bucket of stuff uh, may be impossible. We <laughs> talked to people at Google to figure out how complex it was. We couldn't get clear answers, like what complexity class it was, but they didn't know to expect that question. Yeah, it's that not really yeah. <laughs> Except, and so I have to do the physics thing for a minute here. Okay. You were, I think it may have been when you were talking about the kilobots, and uh, how they could solve a problem if, it, if some little set of bots solved the problem of getting across the river together. Um, That's swarm more river, maybe. Yeah. yeah, but you're talking about these swarms, and it seems just as likely to me that people are going to start discovering that swarms can, of, of, of bots can uh, interact locally, but emergent properties emerge. And this is like condensed matter physics, where you get all of these... Uh, things like your superconductors and various things where basically they're all based on local interactions but they're emergent global properties that right. could be very startling yeah I, that was just an observation but uh i don't know there could be stuff and thank goodness you didn't try to predict any of that because who can predict emergent properties of large assemblages of things like neutrons and, or neurons in consciousness right yeah yeah no forget it it's uh yeah, I mean, who would have seen that one coming, right? It's like, oh, look, we've got this uh, worm over here with seven neurons. What if we <laughs> yeah. do 15 neurons? Nope, no better. What if we do 70 gazillion neurons? Oh, consciousness will emerge. Yeah. That would have been hard to predict, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it would be hard to predict. Do you oh, want sorry. To oh, well, yeah, you know, it's funny. Speaking of emergent, probably was, this is kind of tangential, but it's interesting, is um, uh, there's a sort of, I don't want to say primitive because it's what they were designed it to be, but there's a, a version of, of a bucket of stuff that has where the individuals are like this big, like they're the size mm -hmm. of a baseball called Roombots. And they get the dual the stuff Kelly discussed. They have onboard power. They can talk to each other. They can dock with each other and lock on. Um, and the idea is they're, they're Roombots. They can form into furniture or they can crawl right, up right, right. using uh, sort of like a special gripping structures and, and individual ones can roll, but they can also sort of form into wheels by, by agglomerating. And so one of the cute things we discussed briefly in the book, but to me it's really neat, is this idea that you could use them to run genetic algorithms in the sense that you could, so to speak, you could say like you've got a glob of a hundred robots and you could say, uh, all right, make a random assemblage and invent a random way of moving and get across the room as fast as you can. And then mm -hmm. you know, do that 20 times and we'll select the the best version of it and then mutate off 20 new versions of that. We'll keep iterating. And it's just cool the idea that you could run a genetic algorithm in real life, like in real life mm -hmm. physics instead of in a, in a computer. Um, so that, that that's, you know, that, you know it, it, it's like the bucket of stuff, except the pieces are 10 million times bigger, but still it's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You're making the case that doing the research for this book was something you really enjoyed. This, Most of the time, yeah. This was one of my favorite chapters. So yeah. I, I'm a biologist, and I, I love doing the biology stuff. But one of the reasons I love doing this book is because I really love an excuse to reach way out, outside of what I usually do. Mm -hmm. And so doing stuff like the space chapter and robotic construction and thinking about what robots would do to job creation in the U.S., for example, like, mm -hmm. that was so much fun because I love my parasites but it's so nice every once in a while to get mm -hmm. to think about something totally different. And so I totally got a kick out of researching this book. And yeah. I think that yeah. did Tell us about, about it. This is, this is we, we like to talk to people who write about things that are not our specialties. Boy, do I get to learn things. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a blast. And, you know, every once in a while, it's good to take a break from the thing that you, you know, think about all day long mm -hmm. and get to think about something else. And mm -hmm. So, so Zach, did you do some of the biology chapters? I think you did most of the biology stuff. I think the bioprinting chapter, I did a bit more. Yes. Um, uh, and BCI. Brain and really, yeah, biology. I guess I hadn't thought of those. Biology. But, yeah, th those two I, I worked on quite a bit. Uh, but, but mostly I was doing more of the, um, the other stuff. Um, which is which is good because the, the, actually the, the biology stuff was pretty airy. I thought the synthetic biology chapter was pretty tough, um, partially because <laughs> it's so diverse um, as a field that like encompasses many different things that we tried to you know convey a sense of. Yes, that was we, we <laughs> bit off a lot in that chapter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, synthetic biology is you know I, I was uh, an advisor for the iGEM team here uh, oh, for cool. several years. Yeah, so even I was like trying to wrap my head around it and I went, 
you know, and the secret is to think like an engineer, but somehow to constrain it into biology when biology doesn't <laughs> really want to do that. No. <laughs> I think we probably could have done a chapter just on CRISPR and how it could yeah. be used mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. so there was there was just so much there. It could it could be its own book for sure. Oh, yeah, but yeah, 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 easily. Yeah. Well, yeah. you could have done a chapter on it, but you did a small chapter that didn't seem like it was leaving a lot out. It, oh, good. It, it found a level and it stayed at the level and, and it satisfied me, but that may be because we've read some other books and talked <laughs> to some other people about CRISPR and I had a bit of background, but I thought there was enough to go on. I thought the, I thought the, um, the balance that you found generally was pretty satisfying. Oh, great, yeah, thanks. You're trying to give a sense of why it's exciting. You couldn't possibly cover the whole field, but just to sort of, oh. like, here's a taste of all the different types of things going on. We have been getting people sending us emails being like, you didn't mention blah, blah, yeah. blah in this field. And it's like, well, yeah. there were so many words and so much stuff that I cut out that we wanted to include. I'm sorry, your yeah. thing didn't make it. Sometimes I just want to tell people like that, there are an infinite number of things that we could have included. That Literally we yeah. infinite, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sent me an email saying uh, you got something wrong in the title, but actually it was just that we didn't include this extra thing. And I was like, "You gave me a heart attack." Yeah. And, yeah. And I, anyway, I yeah. like the your stomach feels like it falls. Oh, oh my god! Oh, yeah. What did I do wrong? But then you realize, yeah, oh, okay, it's not not yeah. so bad. Yeah. <laughs> not did you so find bad. anything wrong, Joanne? Not that, as far as I could tell, I felt like the way everything was treated you know, was was at a level enough that that information is there for people to discover, right? So it, if you had tried to go deeper on some more, I think then you could get people could becoming nitpicky, right? Yeah, right. We, we kind of, that was almost like the dividing line because it was like, we, we for every chapter we had at least like three or four people and not all of them, even people in the field, like look at that chapter. So like in addition to having people in like weird space stuff, look at the weird space chapter. We also just had like physics people look at it. Um, and so it was kind of like, there's stuff in BCI where one, once we, like, it got to a point where it was like, there were people disagreeing with each other. And I was like, okay, we can't push further than this. Cause you know, like we, we've right. a little bit of what we as amateurs can say about something. I, I don't, you know, I'm not in a position to have an opinion on, mm -hmm. on like wh which method is better or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. right. Okay. Right. Um, I, I was wondering, as I'm looking at the cover and looking at your comics inside and illustrations, I, you know, I have no idea how publicists handle this. Do they usually hire someone to do the cover art? Did they pay you extra to do this? Or did they go, oh, goody, we just need a bunch of money. <laughs> we should have negotiated. No, I, um, uh, I, I actually don't remember how it came up, but it was, it was, I guess it was kind of like obvious that I should be doing it since exactly. I'm an interior. But uh, yeah, it was actually a more involved process than I thought it would be. I, I think I did like something like 10 different, like not completed designs, but uh, 10, 10 different ways it could be. Uh, and uh, I am, I am not, there's a, there's a, in my head, there's a big difference between art and design and like design, not that I'm great at art, but I'm awful at design. Um, so it, it, it took a lot of doing, uh, to come up with something we were happy. We were very happy with the final cover, but it was, it was, it was for me, like rather painful. I just, d design is like something I cannot wrap my head around. It seems like magic to me. Uh, <laughs> so it's so like, degrees. where yeah. should we put this and where should we, yeah, actually exactly. yeah, 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 humorous, yeah, yeah. you know. You know, with comics, at least to me at this point, it feels like kind of obvious a lot of the, the, the ways you might do a panel and, and, but like, yeah, composing a single image that's going to convey everything just, uh, Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah. To notice, it's we're going to cut you. Yeah. With yeah. The elevator oh, cable. Right. Like, <laughs> is it just my imagination that this was both this was both a space elevator and a little allusion to CRISPR over here. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Look at you, Jeff. Yeah. Wow. Exactly yeah. what we meant. <laughs> <laughs> so. Didn't know there were A T C's and G's in here. Right. Yeah, I, I, I could imagine them. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, Jeff, I'm impressed. Oh. <laughs> well, you should be impressed with us, yeah. you know. Yeah, I want to they put yeah. that in there like that. Yeah. Yeah. Subliminal speaking of, speaking of the cartoons, <laughs> speaking of the cartoons, I enjoyed all of the your author's cartoons, which were little points where uh, you show us what the two of you were thinking and fighting about during the particular <laughs> sessions. And I made a note around page, what, 189 I wrote down, that there was no comic about the nasal cycle. I was a bit disappointed. Uh, yeah, there was. 
<laughs> well, there's a kind yeah. of yeah, there is. about the nasal cycle. It was about the test. Get working on your test or something like oh, that. Oh, well, there was yeah. one at the beginning. There was one at the beginning. At that, the beginning, but, right. That wasn't about the nasal cycle. It was sort of meta and said, True. we'll have something about the nasal cycle there, there, later. There, there probably in an early manuscript was a joke. But what essentially happened is we, in our first manuscript, I think we had like a comic per page. And at some point, I don't know how we missed this. At some point, we did the arithmetic on that. And it was like... Right. The book was going to be 700 pages long. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, it wasn't going to be practical that way. But. No, no, it would be cubic. Uh, it, would, it would be. Uh, really and good. you have nice paper, too. You Don't know, you have yeah. glossy paper. I'm like, wow, yay, publishers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking they decided to go with coated stock because you're going to do the cartoons in color. Yeah, I, I think, think so. Yeah, yeah. And we we don't like dust jackets, and so they all. If you take the dust jacket off, there's also a nice cover. Yeah, yeah. Nice cover. Hey, look at that! Yeah, oh, mystery upon mystery. Love. Did you, we we should have mentioned if you, we have an app, and if you point it at the um, cover, it does a little augmented reality uh, space mm -hmm. space elevator, a little cute thing. Okay, I should do that. I'll get your app. <laughs> the app <laughs> is free. Yes. Oh, yes, the app is free. We're not. Uh, Trying to get seventy cents out of you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, now I I'm following you guys on Twitter, and you know Twitter says, "Oh, you must like them," you know, because I send notes saying you're coming on the show, right? Mm -hmm. And so they keep popping you up, and you guys are busy promoting this. Wow. It's oh, so <laughs> it's I know exciting. All authors are busy, but I thought, whew. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been awesome. Like, so you know, we we were on Science Friday, which was like really great and then mark it's like huh? and then we were in london and we gave a talk at the royal institution and so we've been doing all kinds of awesome stuff but uh we were traveling with our one-year-old uh and that's a little insane so when he was on the west coast he was getting up at three and in london 3 a.m and in london he wasn't falling asleep until 3 a.m so over the course of the month we became more and more zombie-like uh, and it was harder and harder, but at the same time, you know, we were like driven on by the like exciting stuff that we were getting to do and like the awesome interviews was, we got yeah. to do. But it was it felt like it, it was it was as if like you were stumbling around London half drunk, but then you would pop into lecture mode suddenly, and then it was kind of okay, <laughs> I think. And then you'd be in the BBC offices and right. you'd be like, right, I have to be proper, yeah. and uh, <laughs> I need more coffee. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, we we've been really excited about how well things have been going and how busy we've been but we are also happy to be home and it's nice to be home yeah. and getting uh, a little more sleep regularly and the kids are probably happy with that too yeah, yeah. well I, she our, our older one was at grandma's house so she might have been happier at grandma's house <laughs> yeah. I, don't know. I can't be certain that, grandma treats her pretty well yeah. but yeah we, we've been we've been very lucky and very happy with how the book's been received yes, and yes. it's been an awesome month yeah it's yes. fantastic cool. The, um, I'm, I'm, I saw something uh, out of curiosity. You said there's a coffee shop in Ohio, which was the best place to write. And I'm like, wait, your bio says you're at Rice. So I'm like trying um, to sort things out. I don't need to know where you live. but <laughs> well, So I, I went to Bowling Green State University for my bachelor's and my master's. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love that city. And Grounds for Thought coffee shop uh, there is amazing. It's like a coffee shop and a used bookstore. And they have a bunch of tables and because it's the midwest they can afford a bunch of square feet so they're like sure. mm -hmm. you can sit at a table and not feel like you're rushing anyone yes. and their coffee is delicious and so like i and my parents live sort of near there so okay. i can drive there whenever ever i go to visit my parents and so i still did a lot of writing at grounds for thought it's where i wrote like my master's thesis and everything so i like to write there whenever i can so i, I did a lot of writing there while visiting yeah. my mom who was watching our daughter ada so that we would have time to write the book Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. We couldn't have done okay. it without their help, which is why we dedicate the book to them. Yes. yes. I'm down to my list of random observations, but this one is is an excuse to relate a bit of the story about uh, Dr. Bull and his amazing space gun. But there's a question that goes with it, because as I was reading that, it was like one of those really in your face deja vu things, because some episode of some program I've seen in the last few years used this story of the space gun. Really, and, and the events that happened, and the whack, and I don't know what it was. There, but there I, was I don't know if this was it, but there, there was a movie 
made. Uh, I think I want to say, but it was it was way back. It was like in 1994, so I don't know if that would have been it. But there, there was apparently a movie. I haven't seen it. There was a movie like loosely based on it or something like that. I, no, I don't think so. I think it was an episode of some series. Hmm. But oh, you know, I wonder if it was Foil's War because they sometimes base things on weird shit. <laughs> and, and that's that a weird been, story. Yeah, the story I'll have to look into that. But right. anyway, what's the story with Doctor Bull? What a wacko! Yeah, well, real quick, uh, I, I almost I, I almost want to say it's better not to think of him as a wacko so much as a guy who was really brilliant and kind of socially inept and was sort of thwarted by you know society or something, and then kind of became a supervillain. Really, really focused. Yeah, yeah. So it's. I mean, we left a lot out of it because you know, we had to get down to a thousand words. But the the the, 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 the basic deal. I should do this fairly quickly because I go off on a tangent. But like, <laughs> um, you, you got to imagine this guy, and he's like, he's got this sort of weird family structure, where like his his whole family got kind of split up because his dad wasn't making enough money. It's, it's sort of this weird story. But anyway, he you know goes from kind of being this almost Dickensian orphan character to being with this rich family. And they put him in a fancy school, and it turns out he's just like this absolutely brilliant engineer. Mm -hmm. And then he has, in, in a sense, luck, which is, you know, it, it's, I want to say the 60s, and rocket stuff is taking off, but mostly in the U.S., and the U.S. is paying more money. So basically, anyone who's any good in Canada goes to the U.S. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, Bull, as a young man, is sort of patriotic, uh, and so he decides to stay. So long story short, he ends up running a Canadian missile program, like, in his 20s. And it's especially, it's this funny story where he's, like, he's also kind of boyish looking. So there's this guy who looks like he's 12 running a Canadian missile program. <laughs> he's, but it's, it's just like this, like, Tom Swift thing. He's like this boy genius running right. like, this program. And anyway, so he, he the, 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 the background of this is, in Canada, there's not a lot of money. Um, I, I, as I'm told by Canadian scientists, it's sort of the classic Canadian thing. There's just everything is underfunded, so people have to be resourceful. And so he, he can't get access to, like, wind tunnels, so instead he, he gets access... Uh, partially through a friend in the American government. I want to say, I hope I'm not getting this chronologically wrong, but essentially gets access to a huge cannon uh, and, and discovers instead of using a wind tunnel to, to, uh, to test missiles, you can just shoot them really fast. And he has this very simple method of shooting ballistics through like paper and analyzing the results. Anyway, he's a sort of super genius character and he gets a lot of funding out of um, the Canadian and American defense in, uh, agencies to build this super gun. Uh, and it's called Project Harp. That's the I think high altitude research project. And mm -hmm. I think they were shooting you know, shooting very high. Apparently, their atmospheric research was so good that it was used until like the nineties. Um, but anyway, very very long story short, it, it ends up um, getting funding pulled for a variety of reasons. Uh, NASA uh, there was restructuring, so the Army had less money for these sorts of things. NASA takes over. NASA only wants to do rockets reasonably. Um, uh, Canada kind of just gets out of doing this sort of thing. And so his, his dream sort of dies, uh, and, and so he's figuring out what to do with his life. He ends up, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much truncating this, but he ends up in the, yep. like, semi-legal world of munitions dealing, uh, and and a deal goes before wrong. Before you know it. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's this weird thing. When you get the sense that he either was not paying attention uh, or just not recognizing the kind of world he had entered, like, like he was just so <laughs> focused on he wanted to do these projects, and uh, um, he ends up, the, the, the place where it all unravels is there's a shipment that he's routing, he's, he's helping the South African government, which at this time is apartheid, it's, it's a pariah government, uh, and he's routing a shipment through uh, a Caribbean island, I forget, I think it was Antigua, I don't remember offhand, but anyway, the, the people who live here are mostly African heritage, and they find out they're helping ship illegal arms to, uh, to, to this apartheid government, and then, so there's this international incident, and lots of players are involved, and it just sort of unravels. And this guy who had kind of been a Canadian patriot, super engineer, ends up sort of going whole hog into the semi-legal, illegal weapons universe. Um, and anyway, without getting way off track, it all ends up in Iraq. Uh, he's working for Saddam Hussein building yeah. something called Project Babylon, which is this mega cannon that's uh, he's been dreaming about most of his life, and it's laid. It's to be laid into the side of a mountain. Uh, and the, the the sort of really mysterious thing is, you, you know, he is doing weapon stuff for Iraq, but apparently the design of Babylon is not weaponizable. It's it's not. It, you can't move it. You can't aim it. Uh, and it's not pointing at a military target. And as it happens, just it's pointing in the direction that the Earth is spinning, which is what you would want for a space gun. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and it kind of doesn't matter what the second half of the sentence is after you said he <laughs> is doing weapon stuff where I read. Yeah, <laughs> yes, right. Exactly. Um, and so and you can sort of tell the story at almost any point. You could say, and then he works for Saddam Hussein. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's the really crazy part. Um, and 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 anyway, it ends with him dead in a hotel in Brussels. Uh, with twenty thousand dollars on his body at the time. The, again, the yeah. important thing to note is the twenty thousand wasn't taken, so clearly an assassination, not a robbery. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think the the general opinion that we found was that it was probably Israel, it was probably Mossad um, for for kind of obvious reasons, mm -hmm. um, but that it's it's never been confirmed. It, it seemed to us we we did a decent amount of research, and most of the literature was from the nineties. It was contemporary with the events. There hasn't been a lot of mm -hmm. looking into it since. Um, but yeah, what a story. Um, just absolutely is this, is wild. This where we get, is this where we get to say there's nothing about history that necessarily had to be as it was? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. If they had just funded that project to complete it. Right, yeah. if Canada had just been a little more forthcoming uh, on building space cannons, who yeah. knows, yeah. <laughs> so interesting. Um, I, I was wondering, um, rather than asking your favorite chapter, what what chapter are each of you most satisfied with? Where you said, mm. yeah, this Ooh. came out the way I envisioned, or boy, I'm glad it went this way, or, yeah. I think the two I'm most satisfied with are programmable matter and mm, either asteroid mining or cheap access to space. So I guess mm -hmm. those are, I've just named three. So those are three. Yeah. Uh, and And maybe that's because with synthetic biology, I know more of the stuff that didn't make it in there because that's my world. And so it's harder to feel satisfied because there's so much extra stuff going on in the back of my head. Um, whereas those three, I feel like the stuff that we learned, I felt was put together in a nice, fun way. Yeah. And I, th I think with the, with the cheap access to space, I, that's, I, that was, that was going to be my example, partially because it's just, it's one of those fields where it's narrow enough that we felt like, I mean, we couldn't literally read all the literature, but I felt like it was it was pretty comprehensive because there's just not that many people working on crazy ways to get to space. Um, oh, a lot so, of stuff got left out. There, there, there's a lot of stuff that was left out, but it was left out by choice, not by like, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we couldn't do more research or or we missed something or something. It, it was like we cut stuff out and it hurt, but but we knew what we cut out. We cut it out for a reason. But like that was a chapter where I felt like we had really explored every little nook and and. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you couldn't possibly do that with synthetic biology. You couldn't do more than kind of give an overview of many different well, areas. Restricting it to cheap access to space was a very clever clever idea and gave you just the right amount of scope, but kept it kept yeah. it narrow and focused, too, but in a very useful way. I, I, and, the original version was going to be non-rocket space launch, but then reusable mm -hmm. rockets were a thing, and, and we thought we should, we should include <laughs> mm -hmm. it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. There were at least two instances in the book where we got to work with an expert and they like went above and beyond to help us figure something out. <laughs> and uh, Ron Turner at NIAC, NASA Advanced Innovative no, Concepts. It can't be Advanced Innovative, it's NIAC. NASA Innovative, Advanced, Innovative Advanced, Advanced Concepts. 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 Anyway, right. yeah. uh, so we got to talk to this guy, Ron Turner, and we asked him, hey, if you go up in a space elevator, are you gonna puke? <laughs> and he did answer for like a couple hours and then later he sent a bunch of code for MATLAB mm -hmm. to yeah. look at it was MATLAB I wow. think for uh, <laughs> looking at like you know how fast it would be going and what would essentially what would be happening and like and it, the answer was yeah you'd probably feel sick at some point when you got up high enough mm -hmm. uh, and I was like I can't believe someone at NASA spent like <laughs> part of the day writing code to help me figure out if a space elevator would make you puke uh, <laughs> and that was that was actually very exciting. And then we got to Steve Munger at the Taste and Smell Lab at the University of Florida also really walked us through something. And so anyway, we got very lucky. And that, that's that's with the augmented reality. reality. That was, well, so that, yeah. Alan Craig helped us make the augmented reality app. So that was awesome. That was a, yeah. a very cool collaboration. Steve Munger helped us figure out the mirror humans thing. Do you want me to go mm -hmm. into this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Because I have a question related to that. But Good. Oh, we probably don't have an answer to that. One. We'll see. Okay. Okay. An observation then. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so George Church and some other folks uh, are proposing that it would be great if we could make mirror versions of organisms. And so the idea here is that we have molecules. We're all made up of molecules, and those molecules have what's called a mirror version. So, like, you've got your hands. Yeah, they have five fingers. The structures are basically the same, but you can't lay them on top of each mm -hmm. other and get the same thing. They're mirror versions of each other. When you can't rotate one to and get you, the other. You, you, right, yeah. yeah. So Molecules so, are twisty and they twist different ways. Right. Yes. Right. So, <laughs> so what if you could make an organism 
where every one of their molecules were the mirror version instead. So if you could do that, that organism would presumably be free from parasites and pathogens because those parasites and pathogens are expecting to see a certain version of the molecule. And without it, they might not be able to like bind to receptors. And so you could potentially be disease free. You also uh, <laughs> would have to have mirror food made for you because you couldn't digest it otherwise. Uh, and so this was, so this is, George Church wrote a book called Regenesis, I think. And uh, he talked a lot about these mirror organisms. And we thought it was an interesting idea, but it ended up in the graveyard of uh, the Nota Bene for the graveyard of our book, which is where ideas that didn't get a whole chapter ended up going. And partly why we did that is because this is proposed as a way to eradicate diseases from the planet. But we feel like that's a very roundabout way to do it because <laughs> mirror, hu mirror organism, like, so if, if, you know, a normal human and a mirror human met, they could physically mate but they would not be able to produce offspring. So they'd be a different species. So essentially to save humans from disease, you have to create <laughs> another species. And in no time, or, and, yeah, and in no time these mirror humans are gonna walk around and be like, oh, these disease bags, why do we keep them around? They <laughs> yeah. would probably be making their mirror food. Um, and, and so anyway, uh, we, Zach noted, that the mirror molecule for spearmint, the flavor mm -hmm. of spearmint, is caraway, which gives mm -hmm. Jewish rye its distinctive flavor. Mm -hmm. So we were wondering <laughs> if you gave a mirror human rye bread, would they taste spearmint? Mm -hmm. And so you could detect, like, if George Church is secretly making mirror <laughs> humans, <laughs> <if> you <laughs> the root them out because right. they would eat a piece of bread and be like, "This yeah. is really gross." Yeah, yeah. And so we had this in the book, and we were like, "Well, I guess there's no way to know if that's true." And then we were like. Well, maybe there is a way to know if that's true. And so we tweeted, like, are there any experts out there in, like food, uh, in taste food science, and taste yeah. science? Uh, and Stephen Munger from the University of Florida was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll talk to you. Uh, and so we, we called or we sent him an email and we we're like, we have a question we bet you haven't had before. And, uh, and pretty much at the end of the conversation, he was like, yeah, never had that question. Yeah. Uh, it's probably impossible to know the answer to that because it depends on so many different things about <laughs> the way their taste receptors work uh, and blah, blah, blah. blah. Uh, yes. But well, let me think about it, you say. And that was the answer to your earlier part. Like, you're amazed. Why do these scientists and engineers keep helping you with this stuff? And the the secret is in asking interesting questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scientists and engineers still tend to like to play. Yeah. And a lot of people have been trained if you said, hey, would this taste, if we gave you caraway and you're a mirror person, would this taste like spearmint? Most people go, well, that's stupid. I'm going to go grocery shopping. <laughs> but your scientists and engineers go, oh, now there could be a question in there. Let me think about yeah. it. We can make the yeah. question we can yeah. answer. And then they go and they write MATLAB and things for a while. And they say, okay, I've refined the question. And here's what it is. And that, I have the sentence right here. And I'll tell you why I wrote it down afterwards. You wrote, it just so happens that the molecule that gives caraway seeds their carawayish taste is a perfect mirror of the molecule that gives spearmint its spearminty taste. And I wrote that down and made the note. It actually made me say, oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And I, I don't often have that reaction, I'm afraid. I, I like things and stuff, but you know, here was one that just surprised me so much. I said, no, oh, really? Yeah. I said the same thing. Zach, Zach was the one who knew that, and when Zach told me that, I was like, "No." Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and, and I think I think you're right. Uh, Stephen Munger, Dr. Munger, had a really I think he had fun talking to us about it because mm -hmm. it was something totally outside of presumably <laughs> yeah. totally outside of what he had thought about before. Uh, and, I, just, I just love to hear questions that nobody has asked him before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he had fun. We've like interacted a little bit since. It's actually been fun to make lots of friends in different fields. Maybe mm -hmm. friends is too generous, uh, but I, I think of them as friends. Maybe talking to them yeah, friends, for I sure. think we made some friends, yeah. And so it was just really fun to get to talk to people about the stuff that they love doing that they've devoted their lives to. Yeah. Uh, and we, we tried to like pick the people who are really like in the thick of things, which are often not the people who get asked to do interviews very often. Yeah. Uh, and so anyway, it was really, we really had a blast. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I promised to bring up, uh, since Jeff and I are always looking for, 
hey, has this author been in another person's book? Yeah. Well, we didn't find anybody who's been interviewed on Read Science, but I did notice that you really made good use of footnotes and funny mm -hmm. footnotes, much like Mary Roach. So I just want to congratulate you because that's <laughs> a high feat. Well, to funny and informative. Informative. Yeah, they, they their purpose quite well. Thank you. Any comparison to Mary Roach uh, yeah. makes us incredibly happy. We, we think yeah. it's absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's very funny. And I, so, like I said, I listened to the audiobook, and the fact that you just like just so seamlessly, you know, you wherever the number would be, that's where you just read the footnote, and then you continued on. You know, yeah, and I was like, yeah. "That's how it should be done." You know, because some some audiobooks will just skip the footnotes. Oh, that's no fun. Uh, yeah, no, it so this was very important. <laughs> there was some discussion about like, should the footnotes be integrated in as though they're part of the paragraph? And I, I think that might be how it's done in the UK version, uh, which we didn't narrate. Uh, I like but them, like in, in yours, I like them as footnotes on the page. Yeah, I, I, I really did. I liked the way I liked the way it got done here. Yeah. Right, yeah. and the note to Benet's at the end by Zach, well, narrated by Zach. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> those are, everything was. I mean, I, I love the book overall, like how it's put together, etc. So I can't are say we, uh, enough about it. That it's like, hey, holidays are coming up. It looks yeah. like a great gift. Thank yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. We agree. <laughs> are we down to our our lightning round where I just get to relate the odd phrases that I wrote down because I don't know, they found I found them interesting like throw trucks with your mind. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was a, a sort of serendipitous thing. It was actually I knew about that before we started writing this book is this guy um Oh really? Where I think yeah well it was in I think we met because so it's, it's like a weird chance connection, but I, I, I helped organize slightly or I, I helped a little bit organize um there's this event they're still doing called Gamer X, which is like a gaming convention for LGBT um, people, and uh, and it just happened that he, I, you know, I, I was just sort of background for this convention, and he was showing off this product I'd never heard of called Throw Trucks with Your Mind, and it was just like it was this amazing thing, and he was this also just this sort of like great like almost 19th century showman like for uh -huh. Throw Trucks with Your Mind, and he would just you know <laughs> sit you down and hook you up and be like, now if you relax you can throw trucks at other people in the game. And it was this really strange feeling of like, uh, you know, you have to kind of yeah. mellow out in order to kill other people in this video game. And it was <laughs> to very... clarify, it's a brain-computer interface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. EEG to just... that chapter. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was, that was pretty funny. And, and it's like you can tell a lot about his personality, I think, by the fact that the way you throw the truck is by relaxing and being calm. Be calm, yeah. yeah. I was not very good yeah. at it. I tried. I was, I was like, <laughs> could you throw, I don't know, small compact cards with your mind or anything? I could, I could probably do that. Well, I, I believe that it, it, the way it worked, it was like you had to remain calm. Remain calm was sort of like charging up your ability to do something in the game. So you had to yeah. sort of chill out and be okay while you were running around trying not to get killed. It was, it was very, uh, <laughs> very strange experience. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was very happy to learn that orbital speed is about Mach 25, by the way. Yeah. yeah that was something I went, oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Nobody's ever pointed that out to me before, and I never thought about it. And that's just yeah. really useful to know. The, the whole space plane thing, that was another thing that could have been its own chapter, like just the, the, the I don't know, the, 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 like the fact that if you want a space plane, you actually need to be running like four different types of engine uh like for the different phases of, of launch and that's part of why it's so incredibly difficult that and it's mm. Mach 25 so of course everything's difficult at Mach 25 but uh yeah that, that yeah. was a really interesting uh, section to write I, I almost wish we could have written more but uh, well we actually there was more i think there was a hybrid space elevator space plane thing uh oh. that we had to leave out yeah hmm. how about more of x paradox yeah, uh, so more of X paradox. That's, that's uh, about. Yeah, it, really. it, it, it's funny too from a research perspective because I, I had read about it. Uh, this guy named Hans Morvik, computer scientist, and he, he wrote a book called Mind Children in the eighties, uh, which incidentally predicted robot servants by the year two thousand. So I, you know, uh, not wow. totally right, but um, but anyway, uh, he. Um, he, he, he didn't. He doesn't call it more of X paradox. It got named after him later. But the basic idea is. 
Um, there's a lot of stuff that's easy to explain to a person that's hard to explain to a computer and, and vice versa. And so the example we give is like, suppose you have to multiply two enormous numbers. Um, that's really hard for a human to do. It takes a long time and you'll probably screw up repeatedly and then those errors will propagate. It's very difficult, but you can kind of see at a glance, you could explain like, you know, the three or four rules needed to multiply those numbers. You're just repeating mm -hmm. the same rules. So it, it's something that's hard for a human and easy for a computer, and you can kind of see why. It's a narrow set of rules. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the contrast we use, there, there are a couple, there are lots of things you could use. I think the example we use is something that's easy for a human to do is to look at a photo and tell which way is up. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that can be fairly hard for a computer. We, you know, nowadays it's, it's getting pretty good. Facebook can more or less do that, but, but it, it'd still be fairly easy to a fool in a way that wouldn't fool a human. Like if you have someone hanging upside down in a swing, like a human just instantly has the context. Well, that's a swing set in a playground. Um, but it's very hard to explain to a computer how to recognize, by the way, it's a swing set um, in a playground. And, and I, I think that the way to think about that is the, the uh, number of possible rules you might use to come to the conclusion that this person is upside down might be 10 or 100,000 that you've yeah. just picked up over existence. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's the, that's the paradox, something, something that's really easy. For example, it's really easy to ask a human, like, what's cuter? you know, a, um, a shark or a kitty cat. Um, mm -hmm. But, it, you know, like every human will instantly get that right. Uh, where... <laughs> so there are biologists. Well, oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so not, not every human, but... Yeah, some biologists would get that <laughs> question wrong. Um, but... <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, so it's just, it, it's, it, it's sort of famously in the 50s, um, people thought they would have AI figured out like any yeah. minute now. And it just has not panned out. And part of it is stuff like more of X paradox. It's stuff we think is easy. Like folding laundry seems very easy. It's very easy to tell mm -hmm. like a 10-year-old, here's how you fold laundry. Uh, it's very hard to explain to a computer what it means to fold laundry, how to tell a shirt from mm -hmm. a towel, and then yada, yada, yada. So um, it's sort of interesting. Well, there's nothing about history that necessarily had to be as it was, <laughs> yeah. right? And things that, I mean, AI was always going to be the next big thing in about 12 years or so, and that's been six years ago. Okay, one more. Yeah. About, about Plowshare. Quoting, the history of Plowshare is one of potentially great technologies developments being set back by a bunch of smart people acting like morons. <laughs> and, and my comment to you, you know, it's like, ask the authors, like, isn't this always a threat that something good comes it. along and gets taken over by the morons and they just they just crap all over it? Yeah, no, it's it's always a threat and it's a particularly a threat I think when scientists are not. I mean, I'm hoping it happens less often now, but I, maybe I'm hoping that because I'm a scientist now. But like, yeah. the people are particularly cal callous with Project Plowshare. So the idea here is that they were using atomic weapons to try to do useful projects. So like, you know, you want a bay, we'll just blow one up for you. Yeah. And then you can let the water come in. And so they would have like environmental scientists come in and they'd ask them to like do an assessment. And the scientists would be like, yes, indeed. Uh, detonating an atomic bomb here would be bad for the local wildlife and probably bad for the water and, and bad the humans, for the air. The humans. And, well, and then they would say, humans, don't, wouldn't you like an amazing bay in this area? And the humans would be like, no, in fact, we do not want a bay. And the, the people who in, were in charge of these weapons would be like, I think we're going to do it anyway. Yeah. And yeah. they would go ahead and do it. And then afterwards, people would be angry, and yeah. there'd be environmental problems. And Well, they, I don't think they ever built a harbor. I think they just talked about a harbor. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But harbor yeah. was an example. But they'd still de detonate these bombs they anyway. Did, yeah. And so, yeah. so you, you hope that, that we've learned from those lessons over time, but uh, it's sometimes hard to say. Yeah, I, I should add, like, as a code, it probably wouldn't have worked out anyway, because one of the, like, little ticky-tacky but important problems was apparently, I don't remember if we included this in the book, but it was something like, in order to requisition a nuclear bomb to do, you know, peace work, <laughs> you had to talk to, like, 300 agencies, and you're like, well, that seems bureaucratic, but then you're like, no, oh, there's some processes one might want to be a little red tapey. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And so, but the problem is, by the time you're doing that, you might as well just get a whole lot of TNT, uh, like, yeah. like from a, an economic perspective. Well, this is but where time. Really cool. I mean, What's you want to be cool, and it would be cool to do it with big. It would be way things. cooler. It would, yeah, do it all with one bomb. But yeah, <laughs> but th this is also around the time Louise. Do you remember her last name? Rice. But well, that was not until the seventies, though. Oh, all right. Yeah. So at some point, they started finding extra strontium in babies' teeth, and that also made. Oh yeah, yeah. Less excited about using atomic weapons for peaceful purposes, yeah. and anyway. Yeah, and I was getting getting some flashbacks when you were talking about 
fusion and unlimited energy and the cheap and everything. And I still remember some of the marketing for atomic fission power plants. Which but, were exactly the same. Fusion, as, they're very different, negative. They're very different, and there's nothing about history that necessarily had to be as it was. <laughs> Fair enough. Things happen. Yeah. So actually, um, we're near the end, or maybe at the end. But I'm curious if there's anything you guys wanted to add that uh, you wanted to say we haven't asked you, or. Oh man, you could talk about the robot. We don't have time. Buy our robots. books. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that there's nothing we would say briefly that uh, yeah, yeah. It just, we hope you enjoy reading it as much as we enjoyed writing it. Oh, I loved it. It's it's a fantastic book, and yeah, it might be in a few people's stockings, so, or, yeah. So, so. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very good, very good. Thank you guys so much. It does make me wonder if, you know, at some point in your life you were sitting around saying, one day I'm going to write a really fun book. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping we'd write a book at one point, yeah. but uh, yeah. but yeah, I'm, I'm glad we wrote this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Plans for another one? Yeah, maybe. First we're catching up on sleep, and <laughs> then we're like, going to think yeah. a little hard. We, we have an idea <laughs> that we're working on, but we'll, we'll, we'll sleep on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, tell me you would only do it if you decide that it's going to be fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, it would definitely be a fun book. That's yeah, the yeah, main yeah. thing we're thinking about. Yeah, but it would be fun to write it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's, yes. Yeah, no. They, this idea, I think, would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Kelly and Zach, for joining us and for writing your book. And, oh, just to remind everybody, in case you haven't caught on yet, the book is Soonish, 10 Emerging Technologies That Will Improve and or Ruin Everything. Uh, thank you, Jeff, once again, and uh, thank you all for tuning in to Read Science, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much for having yeah, us. Thanks for having us.